The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. That's right. This is the Sample Chapter Podcast. My name is Jason A. Meiske, your host for this and every episode, and I cannot wait to dive into this so, so fun episode. Hey, I hope you're all doing really well wherever you are in the world. I hope you are safe and secure. Uh, you know, if we're all doing our part by you know, washing our hands, sanitizing, and cleaning up after ourselves, that kind of thing, and of course practicing our social distancing, then we will get through this thing. Uh, <laughs> it sounds weird to say we're going to get through this together, but you know, in that sense of unity, in that we're all doing the right thing, then we are doing it together, and we're going to get through it. And I'm thinking of you, wherever you are, whether you're in Italy, whether you're in California, whether you are in Australia, or New York, anywhere you are, uh, I know this show is getting to you, I know you're listening, and I appreciate you, I'm thinking about you, and uh, I'm praying for us all. So... Now, of course, this is not the reason I sound a little subdued this morning. It's just really early. <laughs> I, I'm just so busy, uh, ironically, because of, of the situation the world is in right now. Uh, you know, I'm one of those essential workers. I'm the only one left at my job that <clears throat> isn't at risk due to one health uh, reason or another. And so I am working an awful lot lately. But uh, my uh, social interactions online and getting back to authors through email, that kind of stuff has definitely suffered here lately. So if you are, uh, a, if one of you listeners are an author who's reached out to me and I haven't responded in a while, uh, I deeply apologize. I, I, it's just been really, really busy. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting back to a normal schedule. But... As I was saying before, though, I mean, it's it's really early. I, I'm up at uh, up at five o'clock this morning, so that I can complete this episode and have things done ahead of time. I like having these episodes done well ahead of time now, as opposed to waiting to the last minute like I used to do. And uh, let me tell you, the coffee has not kicked in yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, that that's a small price to pay. I remember I used to do this an awful lot when I first started the show, ironically back when I was working two jobs and I started this show and I was finishing my first book, but uh, you know, that was a couple years ago and I don't know, maybe it was working the two jobs that gave me more energy, but now I'm not and uh, so I don't, if that makes any sense at all, if you're following that train of thought. <laughs> hey, uh, so while you are practicing your social isolation, uh, staying home alone, I do have another podcast recommendation that I would like to give you. Uh, there's a, uh, a new one I've come across, actually an old friend of mine from back in the mid-2000s, uh, Hannah Mamaro, and that's M-A-R-M-A-R-O. She does a show called The Story Dive, and I came across it here just recently. I saw that she posted that she had kicked off her show with a couple of episodes, and uh, being old friends and uh, co-workers, I wanted to check it out, and it's a great show, and Hannah does, I, I can't believe the amount of work that goes into this, uh, she does a dive, deep dive, into a specific story of some kind, like uh, her very first one was The Power of Stories and Kiefer Sutherland, and essentially it's talking about the everything that was going on with 24 back at its at the height of its power and how it affected uh, real life. Uh, she also has episodes about a story called The Monk, which has been fascinating. I've never heard of this book before, but she does a, a serious deep dive into that. Uh, but I have to say my favorite so far has been episode two, Sweep Oh No. And it's a 
uh, you know, once again, a deep dive into the story of chimney sweeps. It's so cool. It's so much fun. And uh, I highly recommend it. She's working on new episodes right now. So once again, that is Story Dive with Hannah Marmaro. Well worth your time. And well, it's going to leave you wanting to know more. So check it out. As for me and my personal Story Dive, <laughs> I had hoped that by the time this episode came out, my pre-order would be ready. Uh, the book would be all set. My second book, Novel Idea. But I'm not quite there yet. Um, as I alluded to before, I am suddenly working so much more that I'm getting 10 or 15 minutes to edit uh, during my writing time in the morning. Um, well, you know, here's here's what it is. You know, the schedule has really kind of messed me up because now I'm not waking up as early as I used to with my son to get him off to school because he's not in school anymore. And that's usually my time. Well, now I'm also working longer and later. And so <laughs> it seems like I'm up a little bit later. I'm more tired. So I'm taking that little bit of extra sleep in the morning, which in turn messes me up, you know, and I'm falling into that trap. I know that's what it is. So this morning was really nice to get up early and work on this. And I'm going to try to continue doing this method of getting up early so that I can get back into my method of editing and, and taking care of things. So as I've promised before, I will have, I will share with you first and let you know that the pre-order is up and available when it is. And uh, I have a very special surprise planned for when it goes up. So stay tuned for that. Uh, a little bit of coffee. All right. Well, let me thank first off my sponsors. You store all out of Warrensburg, Missouri, right here where I live. They have been a lifetime sponsor of the show. They've been with us since the beginning. Hey, if you are in the market for self-storage, need to clean out the garage, or make room for uh, the, the summertime, you're going to prepare for some you know, other things going on, look no further than you store all. With two facilities that are fully fenced, gated access with your own private gate code, and 24-hour Video surveillance on more than 60 cameras. They have security that you wouldn't believe. Um, and that's just the things I, I talk about on here. <laughs> hey, the climate control is a true climate control, meaning it has air conditioning, heating, and dehumidification. And their, both of their facilities run off of solar power with LED lighting. So they are a clean and green facility. Check them out online at ustorall.net. That's spelled the letter U-S-T-O-R-A-L-L dot net. Next up, of course, my favorite writing software, Scrivener. You know, one of the things I love about Scrivener is that they are on... I have both the regular version of them, uh, desktop version, for my laptop, for my computer, and on my now my iPad as well. I have the app, and on my phone, by the way. So what's great about that is that even in times like this when I'm working so much, I can still take a break at work and open up my phone or open up my iPad, pull up Scrivener, and right there is my document, my most recent editing of what I was doing on Novel Idea, or or perhaps a light bulb went off on the uh, other stories that I'm working on, and I wanted to get that down before I forgot about it. I can open up that story. Scrivener has it all right there waiting for you wherever you are and the mobile writing part of the portion of this is where it's at and i mean i love this and uh, and all the features about scrivener so if you're interested in giving scrivener a try check out an ad for them uh you know what let's go ahead and play the ad right now jason here Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, 
you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. All right, well, there you go. Don't forget to use that coupon code CHAPTER at checkout and save yourself 20% on the regular desktop version, just like I use. Not the mobile, that's different. <laughs> Wish I could help you there, but I can't. All right, hey, I want to thank Pop Goes the Culture Network. They've got several shows over there coming to you week after week. Uh, the flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture Podcast, comes to you every Friday. Uh, they are... Uh, they usually get together at the theater. There's a back room at the theater where they would go to the Alamo Draft House in Springfield, Missouri. And, you know, of course, can't go there right now. Can't do that. But they have been uh, doing what they can. The show must go on, as they say. And uh, they are doing unique get-togethers online to still bring the show to you. It's been a lot of fun to listen to. Lately, they've been doing... <laughs> They've been talking about the best uh, character on a product. Uh, by that, I mean uh, Captain Crunch, Kool-Aid Man, Chester Cheetah, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, they've been doing uh, weekly polls, bo voting on who's the best out of each one, coming down to the final championship, uh, which actually is this week. So make sure you go in there. You can check out the last few weeks. And uh, don't forget to tune in this week. And uh, you can find out who won the poll. Me personally, I'm a Kool-Aid man myself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I want to thank my friends over at Project Entertainment Network. They have now crossed that 25 show mark, meaning that there are now 25 shows on the network. And this is a wide variety of subjects. Uh... Some some really interesting ones have been added just in the last week, and I I'm I'm having <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble keeping up with all the new shows, and of course checking them out when they come on, and I want to see what they're like and and what they're about, and just so many cool shows, and I'm going to be pulling down ads for them here real soon for all these new shows, but uh, check out this one. Every person's story has something to teach us how others view life how obstacles are overcome, how joy is felt, how fears are faced, how love is expressed. The Matters of Faith podcast explores individual stories of people's lives and how faith plays a part. It may not be your story, but it may help shape yours. The Matters of Faith podcast with Jay Wilburn is on Project Entertainment Network. All right, well, my guest this week is Stephanie Douglas out of California. Uh, Stephanie and I, as you hear, had a lot of laughs. Oh my gosh, she was such a delight to talk to. Uh, we had a wonderful time uh, going over, you know, of course, uh, COVID-19 safety and, uh, you know, the little things that uh, we've got going on right now. We talked about her writing. We talked about music because uh, she does write her own music that, to go along with uh, her latest book. We also talked about uh, life and dreams no longer being on pause, uh, you know, because Stephanie was one of those like myself that uh, had that dream of writing for a long time, but then put that on pause because of life getting in the way. And uh, so the dreams that she had got put on pause until finally reaching a point where uh, she jumped forward with it and uh, got on, got back on that horse and got to writing. And so that was a really great conversation. We have a lot of fun talking about all of that and so much more. Uh, you're going to hear us laughing an awful lot. Uh, you're also going to hear a sample from one of her songs that she sent me. Uh, that's going to be playing in the midst of our uh, of our talk when we start talking about the music. And uh, I'm going to probably play a little bit of it of another song at the end of the show. So make sure you tune in for all of that coming up. Uh, well, you know what? On second thought, let's just go ahead and play another sample of one of her songs right now, and then we'll get into the interview with Stephanie Douglas. See you on the other side.
Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast. Hey, this week we are sitting down with a young adult author who loves to devil in the ominous, the dissident, and the vulnerable world of dystopian adventure. Stephanie Douglas lives in sunny Southern California with her son and their two snuggly cats, and in her spare time enjoys hanging out with friends at the beach and spending quality time with her son singing whatever the mood takes her. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It is great, great to be here. Thanks, Jason. (laughs) Oh, it's my honor. I'm so happy to have you here, and you have been so patient as we try to get this set up in the midst of every all the craziness going on. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it has been so crazy, and believe me, I I don't think that I've had to wait very long at all. I appreciate you taking the time to reach out to me and. And I hope that you're doing well as we all practice our social distancing. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Well, I guess the first and very important question is, do you have toilet paper? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Thank goodness, yes. Right before, I think like two days before the panic shopping began, I had gone out and purchased our paper products. So we were good. (laughs) And it was such a... Oh, my gosh. The next time I went to the store and saw just the emptiness, it was overwhelming. And I'm not going to lie. My heart, like, raced a little bit. Like, did I get us enough? (laughs) So, fortunately, yes, we are good. (laughs) Well, that's good. That's good. Glad to hear. You know, it might be something about authors because it it, (laughs) – same thing for me. I Just less than a week before this all really went wild, I had been to the store. I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and stock up. And I brought, yeah. I came home with you know toilet paper and groceries and other stuff. And my wife was like, I thought we were going to shop later in the week. And I was like, eh, I was there. I just figured I'd go ahead and do it. And lo and behold, uh, it just, uh, wow. <laughs> thank goodness you did not wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I didn't go crazy. I wasn't like coming home with a truckload. Yeah. So. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> a truckload of toilet paper. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, so how how are you doing? You're in uh, California. How how is it going there for you? Are you, are you safe? Uh, yes, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, we are safe. My son and I are doing well. I, I will say my son works at CVS, so as a mom, it's a it's a little bit disconcerting <laughs> knowing that he's there and everybody's coming in, coughing and handing him. He says that he, hand, he they hand him like moist dollar bills, which I'm just <laughs> mortified by that but grateful they have hand sanitizer <laughs> that, he's, that he comes home and he's doing well and has no symptoms and we're just staying away from people when he's not at work so um we are safe thanks and, and you are you doing well are you safe oh yes yes i'm doing well i'm i'm as we were talking before i'm the only one left at my job that that's not high mm-hmm. risk so I'm sanitizing everything. I have a cloud of Lysol that follows me everywhere. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like the reverse of Pigpen from, from uh, Peanuts. I, <laughs> but, That's awesome. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, uh, yeah, I stay the only person who's, who's good to go and can continue working. Um, but it's just been a lot of extra hours that I was not expecting. So, Holy so, cow. But we'll see. It's it's otherwise it's been fine. Um, my kids are all doing well. My my wife's job is adjusting to the potential of working from home, and uh, mm. yeah, and so I'm I'm looking forward to it. But it, that sounds like something that you are already used to as well with your job, and then being an author as well. Yes, fortunately, um, it it hasn't been that much. It hasn't really been an adjustment for me. A lot more hours as as other people are adjusting things. Kind of, I, I do have a day job along with my f- most favorite writing job that I have. Um, but with that, you do end up, you know, picking up where people are trying to either they're not well themselves or or they are just um, their lives have changed from a work perspective and and in order to make sure that things stay afloat um i'm I'm also picking up quite a few extra hours myself but i'm happy to do it because these people really matter to me wow that's nice yeah so all right so you've got two books that i can tell right now How, how long have you been writing I've been writing for about, I would say about five years. Uh, the uh, Calisandra Fractured is is my 
my newest favorite, of course, Finding Francesca was my favorite to begin with. Uh, it was it was where I really just found how much I had missed being creative. I was um, I used to do theater when I was in high school and and for the in my college years and and I loved performing and, and my favorite part of that was was actually singing and doing character development. I I would write big long stories about these characters and who they were in the community and how they had their friendships and what were their first stuff. It was really in depth, but mostly just because I loved that part. And so when I became a mom and um and ended up uh, having to uh, get divorced, unfortunately, but during that period of time, it was really necessary for me to put that creative side on hold so I could just really focus on, um, you know, raising my young son to be a man with integrity and mm-hmm. we had family time and structure and, and, and a solid growing up experience for him. And now he's an adult and I'm like, Oh, bring that creativity back. And so it's been <laughs> such a treat to dive back into stories and characters. And so, Finding Francesca was one of those ways that, you know, as he became more independent, I, I could intermittently write. Uh, but Calisandra Fractured, uh, which I anticipate being a, tr- a trilogy, it's mapped out to be a trilogy, but it it is my fully immersed, immersive entry back into being my creative self. And I just love it. I love it. <laughs> that's great. I think Thank that's you. where the uh, I think that's where the podcast really kicks in for me. Uh, for I had always wanted to write. I'd always wanted to create. I enjoy creating things. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, it was it was. And, and I've told this story a hundred times on the show, so everybody listening is going, "Oh, <laughs> here he goes again." When I found out I was going to be a grandpa, that's when I was just like, "Oh gosh, all right." I I wanted to be an author by now. I wanted to have so many things in place. So that's when I started getting serious about being an author. And then I stumbled upon podcasting and interacting with authors here like yourself. And it's amazing how many. How many other authors who same kind of thing? They they put their focus into their work and mm-hmm. you know life as it is, and then they finally get that moment like what you have, where it's like, okay, now it's time for me. I want my time to create again, and I'm I'm so happy to hear that you you grabbed it and went for it. No, it's true because I think there was there were times, you know, as it was raising my son in those quiet moments at night when you've taken care of everything and you're laying there and realizing, you know, there's just this longing for creative expression. I think when you're a creative person, that creative expression is like breathing. It's so important and critical to just feeling alive and so in those moments sometimes there was there was worry like I I remember my my little quiet voice inside would say you know did you give up did you let it go is it done and I'm like no 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 (laughs) it's on pause it's gonna come back and I think it's just it just knowing that I wasn't um giving it up and letting it go and and letting it die that there was always this hey it's just on pause as soon as as soon as you know you've done your job and you've raised this amazing young man and 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 he's a little more independent and he's stepping into his life then you have this full time to just dive in and 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 make the most of it like take all these years and put it all into however you want you decide to express that cuz i wasn't i really didn't know how it would be expressed and then the funny thing is i had this really strange nightmare a couple of years ago where in the middle of the night i woke up uh, or in the middle of the, in the dream my character in the middle of the night had woken up thinking there was thunder and i remember being in this victorian style home and walked down the stairs and and looked at this couch in a living room and suddenly the trunk of a tree came through the roof and then was pulled back out and then appeared in another part of the room and then pulled back out kind of like a puppeteer was like uh, above the house putting it through and it, it the rush of adrenaline I don't even know why it was that scary but <laughs> the rush of adrenaline just like woke me up and and you know I just couldn't shake it for two weeks I was still thinking about this dream and like how scary would it be to to wake up and find something unexplainably different in your living room and then what if you what what if you were 16 years old and saw that same thing and everyone you knew was gone and you didn't know what had happened. And I decided, you know, 
I can't shake it. It's it, it's really starting. I'm driving around and formulating the story. I, I decided to, you know what, let's just put pen to paper, so to speak, or fingers to the keyboard and, and wrote the story. And it really just felt like it wrote itself. It just, I was so fun. It was so fun writing it because I wanted to also know what happened next. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it was just, I'm just so glad in a weird way that nightmares exist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah. See, you're reminding me. I don't. I don't have time to go into all this, but gosh, you're reminding me of some nightmares where I woke up convinced they were real and that my yes. life had changed. And it oh. took me like an hour before I realized, like, wait a minute. I okay, no, that was a dream. And wow, oh, that's intense. That's like that. It leaves you feeling unsettled. <laughs> it, it did. Yes. Oh gosh, yes. And that was. Oh man, maybe almost 20 years ago that I had that dream. I still remember what it felt like. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. So I'm sure it's uh, kind of like with, with you. It's probably something that I'll go in a book one of these days, but right probably now, your subconscious <laughs> is like, your subconscious is like, come on, we've got something here. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had the time I'd go into it, but it's pretty outlandish. So I don't know how Ooh. I'd fit, ever fit Uh-oh. it in. <laughs> it's like a twilight zone thing. So. Oh, <laughs> Well, that could be intriguing. There you go. <laughs> well, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about finding Frances- Francesca. So, finding Francesca, um, finding Francesca was a different take on this on on handling depression, I, and and this could be just even during that time. I was really missing. <laughs> I was missing singing. I was missing the creative expression of of characters and and feeling a little down and and there were other people I think that I had known who were also just in their life feeling having a a a more debilitating experience with depression where it was really clinical they were you know hospitalized with it and it was really a challenge and 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 some of the things that they would share with me were you know people telling them to reject this part of themselves and they need to think a happy thought or write your gratitude journal. And and there's some value to that. But when you are that level of depressed, um, what, what they would tell me is, you know, that thinking that last happy thought there, there, what they were experiencing was if I can't feel happy with this last happy thought, that's the only thing holding me into this life. And so that was so scary. I decided to, what if we took this from a different angle and imagine subconsciously that we have this boardroom of personality traits that, you know, have gotten a bad rap from a judgmental standpoint. And, you know, what if we could meet them? What if we could meet them and hear what their origin story was and how did they get created and create, you know, in, in, and in a way that they're expressing that we think is sabotaging us, but in, in reality on a subconscious basis, we're, they're really protecting us. And so um, what I ended up doing is writing these, by taking my own self, my own dissecting my own personality and putting the sabotaging traits basically up front for everyone to see. And each chapter is me just having a conversation and, and writing out the scene as I'm ha- as it's happening um, in my mind, taking that moment to address them and I, and really just finding that there was a part of me that, you know, I was really struggling with my weight and I was so judgmental about it. And, and what had happened is, you know, when I looked at that part of my life, the origin of that was, you know, when I was in seventh grade, I had, I had developed early. I was a little heavier and the boys in my middle school often in the hallway, I would get rushed with a cluster of them and they would touch me everywhere. And, and it was so upsetting that um, when I would put on weight, I, w- I didn't have that happen. So I put on extra weight. They didn't necessarily find me as attractive and I was safe. And so recognizing that in that story and, and, and it's, and it's written as a story. Each chapter is, is written in an, in an interesting way. It's not clinical. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. It's just written with this idea from a positive perspective. What if we can understand that this part of me was, was not trying to make life harder for me. It was actually trying to protect me and to be able to, in that moment, say, say to that part of me saying, listen, I'm so grateful you saved me in a time when 
I just didn't have any way to be protected. The teachers weren't protecting me. There was, there was no one to help me but myself. But I don't need that anymore as an adult. I, I am not at risk for that. I know that there are ways that I can take care of myself in my adulthood and I embrace you. And, and then the weight just came off after that. So that's, that's kind of a little brief summary of, of how finding Francesca evolved and, and through those stories, sharing it with some of uh, my friends who were going through um, really such debilitating depression in their own lives, uh, they found a lot of comfort and and started doing that within themselves and and found that they were getting better that they that they had also been looking at these parts of themselves in a in a very um, mean and mean spirited way really and um, you know that along I'm sure with other things did help uplift them and take a perspective of rather than judgmental being judgmental at the things that we are not happy with in our own lives instead being like, Oh, this part of me just loves me. And just, you know, I was seven or I was nine and this was the best, most creative way I could come up with protecting myself in a situation that, that I felt I needed to be protected. <laughs> Sorry. That's kind of long winded, but <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it sounds like a very, uh, I don't know, almost like a lovely introspective view on, what's making you happy or what's not making you happy. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to take that and write that down. That's perfect. <laughs> I, I, I could not have done this for my own work. It's come with practice talking to authors every week. That's <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, it's very nice. That sounds good. And I, and it's exciting to me because I see too, that it's on Kindle unlimited. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's only 134 pages, which is cool too. So this is like a, a quick read and, and it sounds yep. fascinating. Yeah, I wanted if I felt like, you know, I wanted just enough of the story so that there's it, it creates this idea that you realize there those are my these are my little um, protectors. Um, you're everyone's going to have their own. And I think if it was this big, long book that I, I think that it would it would lose it would lose the intrigue and, and lose the ability to inspire people to be like, hey, you know what? What areas am I sabotaging myself in or where am I feeling a little low and 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 give you some tools. And then in the back of it, I actually put a full list of like a big list of my many um, least favorite character traits. And then and then I put in like, here's where they started. Here's some things that I've been saying about them that are just not very nice. And here are some things that, you know, are really affirming to them and embracing of them. Um, so if, you know, if people don't want to go through that experience, they could easily flip to the back and be like, oh, the, you know, procrastinator. Well, that's me today. <laughs> how do I how do I take this and maybe turn it around? And 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 so there's there's an option to just kind of flip through the back and, and see if maybe that might inspire um, people to find their own way out of a, a behavior that they're not really enjoying. Yeah. OK. Well, that sounds fascinating. I think it's definitely something I'm going to have to check out. And I, I am a, a Kindle Unlimited uh, subscriber, and, oh, in which everybody listening, I don't know why you're not. You need If you're not subscribed to it, you need to be. Right now, they're giving away two free months for a trial basis. So get subscribed to it, and then come in here and grab one of these books. These are This is fantastic. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. <laughs> I love Kindle Unlimited. Like that is just that's how I that's my little qual that's my little how do I pamper myself? You know? Oh yes, 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 and it helps me read so many different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yep. So so this leads us into your next book, your most recent one, Calisandra Fractured, and tell us a little bit about this. Right. So Calisandra Fractured is a, the story is about a 16 year old girl named Cassie who was startled awake in the middle of the night and discovers her family is missing and everything she knows has changed. The landscape has changed. Even even where uh, she's living when she opens the door and goes outside, everything looks different. And not knowing who she can trust, Cassie takes on the name of Calisandra. And the story is her trying to figure out what happened to her family, what happened to the landscape. And, and then within that period, she finds that she's in great danger and just does her best to stay safe as, um, she, as she tries to figure out what happened. Okay. So what I'm, what's interesting here is to this one is this is a young adult. 
is this something that you, you know, kind of came naturally or is it uh, just the way the story took you? You know, it, it's where the story took me. I think initially um, the, the story comes from that, from that, from being just in a nightmare and, and imagining, you know, what if you had something just so crazy happen in your environment and you, you're, you know, you can't explain it. And what if, what if that that happened to you and you were 16 and, and your family was gone and, and you had to just figure out how to move forward on your own. I, I think that it, it it was a lot more interesting from a 16 year old's perspective. I think as an adult, we, we have life experience to pull from, but when you're 16, you've learned a lot. You've, you you feel pseudo like an adult, but you still have people mentoring you and guiding you and, and keeping you safe and feeding you. You know, there, there's, there's a safety net around you. Um, she's completely lost hers and she, um, moves forward to just figure out what's happened. And, and, and she is in a, in a, in a new world. And, um, and it, I think the story, the adventure of figuring out who she is through these life experiences and, and finding out what happened to her family. I, I, it's just fascinating. I found it to be fascinating when I was writing it. <laughs> and well, and additionally fascinating with this is that you have music, to go along with it. And is this is some music that you made yourself. So uh, there are 18 total songs. So there is a soundtrack with it uh, that you can go in the back of the book. I did, I made it accessible through QR code. So you, if you purchase the book, the codes are in the back and you can listen to the songs uh, or you can purchase it. If you would like to experience that in a different way. Um, I wrote three of the songs. I wrote the, and then I also was the vocalist for three of the songs. Uh, there are songs in the story that one of the main characters is part of this resistance group called the Anastasi. And she communicates to other members of this group because they are in secret. She communicates to them through um, coded words in her songs, in her performances. And initially there was no plan to add music. Initially it was just the story. But after I wrote her, um, her name is Marissa. When I wrote Marissa's song, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to hear the song? Um, I had just written the lyrics. I'm like, wouldn't it be really cool as an, as a reader to experience it as along with the main characters, as if you're a part of the audience. At that time, I wasn't sure how I would make it happen, but it was so intriguing. I'm like, I'm going to make this happen. And and then um, later, the additional songs were because of this group, because of the information that Cassie is going to learn that makes that puts her in danger uh, in order to have those conversations music was is going to be filtered in through like a hacking system so that so that they can speak openly and um and not put themselves in danger when they're sharing that information. Uh, so what ended up happening is I had, I had friends and, and my son read through these sections that I had determined would have music. I wanted the music to have the feel of those scenes. So there's a moment where she's just longing for the comfort of her mom and her mom would play piano when when she and her sister were growing up and she she just longed for that and so the music that plays during the scene where they are able to speak openly is this beautiful music that has that piano element to it that has that nostalgic longing type of feel to it so when I would work with each of the musician I would describe to them the scene I would give them the length of time 
of the, of the music that was needed. And then stylistically, I would say, you know, this is a Spanish guitar scene. I wanted to have a Spanish guitar, but I wanted to build in momentum and emotion as if there's a, there's just suspense that, that moves into fear, that moves into resolution as they come up with a solution to, um, her being in danger. And so, it's it's just that was it was so fun to have the music come in and and I added that in after I had written the full manuscript so I would I would know what each of those scenes really needed from a from a cinematic or a, a musical experience so that it could really immerse the reader into it as if you were there with Cassie and the other characters oh wow that sounds incredible Thank you. Oh, it was, oh my gosh. I think my heart just like was like the Grinch. It like got bigger, like three sizes bigger after working with all these musicians. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. That's great. And such a unique idea. I mean, it's, I've had authors on here who are also musicians and we've had some songs on the show before, but this is, I, I think the first time where it's an actual story and the music goes along with the novel itself so this is really cool this is going to be a a unique experience for our listeners thank you it's so exciting it's so exciting i you know i know that we have to you know as writers and you're a writer so you understand there's editing involved and editing isn't the most fun part of writing Mm -hmm. but when what would end up happening is i would be reading i would be reading to edit and then get caught up in the story. Even though I wrote the story, I would read like, oh, it would get me. It would yeah. be, I would fall into it and have to go back and start over because it, editing is critical. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. I'm still uh, up to my eyeballs. Hopefully, by the time this episode comes out, my book, will, my next second, will be available. But we'll see. I don't know. I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, but I, oh, I totally absolutely. understand. <laughs> I hope so. Good luck. Maybe the social distancing will help you like (laughs) hunker down and get it done. Maybe so. Maybe so. There's a silver lining to all this. (laughs) (laughs) We need something. Well, so, so where can, where can people find and follow you online? Oh yeah. So you can find, um, Calisandra Fractured, as you'd mentioned is, can be found globally at Amazon and definitely Kindle Unlimited is a great way to access it. Um, people can also go to my website at uh, www.calisandra.com and Calisandra is spelled C-A-L-L-A-S-A-N-D-R-A. Um, and they, and also if they go to my website, the sample chapter you'll hear today is also on my website and I've included the song. It will play when you go to the sample chapter tab. It plays so that you can experience what that song sounds like, um, as you're reading that scene. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And do you have links for your musicians as well where they can, people can find them? So I have, I worked, there's this uh, platform called um, Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. Um, I, I, have you heard of them? They're fantastic. So I, they have um, freelance musicians from all over the world. So many of the musicians I worked with were, you know, in Serbia and Croatia. We had some people in Venezuela. We had some people in Alaska and in the U.S., of course, but some some people in Ireland and Italy and then Japan. So they really, um, what was fun was it's almost like seeing an audition. People would give samples of their work so you could go through and, and hear the musical sounds that they, that they, um, were their skill sets. And, and then I ended up just selecting and reaching out to them and, and communicating with those. So the musicians, I've, I've included their names in the back. So when you do go to the back of the book, uh, it has all of their names, and so you would easily be able to go on, either search them and, and find additional music that they have on their own, um, but also reach out to them on Fiverr and see you know, how you can find additional music from them as well. I think they would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that's a great site for, uh, for all sorts of uh, creativity on there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful getting to speak to you, Stephanie. I've had a lot of laughs before we even got started, and uh, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for coming on. 
Oh, thank you. This has been so much fun and just what I needed. <laughs> just what I needed during this really, really crazy time. So thank you, Jason. Thanks for all you're doing and best of luck on your book. I'm so excited for you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to step aside and hand the floor over to our guest, Stephanie Douglas, with her latest book, Calisandra Fractured. Slowing to a walk to catch her breath, Cassie looked around, making mental notes of her surroundings. The terrain had become less rocky. Looking down, she observed the outline of tire tread marks along the dirt path. Well, I guess we're not alone, Cassie said aloud and jumped as a crow started cawing loudly in a nearby tree to her right. Nervously laughing, she addressed the crow and said, Yes, that's right. It's just you and me here, wherever here is. Admiring the silky blackness of the crow, she looked into its raven black eyes and felt a peaceful connection. It broke eye contact, turning to look at the path behind her and began cawing loudly as if to warn her. Cassie turned to look and saw a bus driving along the dirt road toward her. The crow cawed again, but this time Cassie could have sworn she heard the word run within its cawing. Feeling a sense of dread, she quickly ran into the trees to hide. As the bus approached, it slowed and then stopped a few feet ahead of where she had been standing only a moment before. Cassie watched apprehensively as the door opened and a man wearing military fatigues stepped out. He had short, dark, blonde hair, a commanding stature, and even from a distance appeared intimidating. Sauntering toward where Cassie had been standing, the man stopped, spotting the impressions her shoes had made in the dirt. He knelt down to get a closer look and then lifted his head peering in her direction. It seemed as though he was looking straight through her. Her heart racing, Cassie silently said to herself, don't see me, don't see me, don't see me. The man reached to a device on his right shoulder, squeezed the sides and said, we've got to run away. His voice was deep and threatening. Cassie held her breath as the man started walking toward her. Quickly determining she could not outrun or fight him off, she slowly stood and raised her hands. The man towered over Cassie. She saw a metal badge with the name Sergeant Leonard engraved on it. Sergeant Leonard scowled down at Cassie, turned her around abruptly, and began securing her wrists in handcuffs. He did not bother removing her backpack. Instead, he chose to fasten her hands on the outside of it, putting a painful strain on her shoulders while simultaneously making her feel small and helpless. Holding Cassie's left arm to guide her, Sergeant Leonard walked Cassie toward the bus, trying not to stumble as he pulled her along. Cassie glanced over and saw the crow watching her. She made eye contact and once again felt a connection to the bird, which infused her with a sensation of calm. Move it, Sergeant Leonard said as he forcefully squeezed her arm to grasp her attention and began walking faster toward the bus. Sergeant Leonard's hand gripped her arm with such strength, even though she stumbled to keep up, the pace never faltered. Stumbling, Sergeant Leonard shook Cassie into place before she could fall. After the second time of nearly falling, Cassie heard the crow lift off from the trees behind her, cawing loudly as it flew away. Sergeant Leonard lifted Cassie to the first step of the bus and pushed her up the next two steps. After the second row of seats, there was a small wall of thick barbed wire fencing connected at the center by a large metal gate. Sergeant Leonard unlocked the door and roughly pushed her inside, locking the gate behind her. Fortunately, her shoulder caught the side of one of the seats, spinning her around so she landed on her backside instead of her head. Cassie awkwardly got to her feet and quickly sat in one of the seats to her right, correctly anticipating Sergeant Leonard would be gunning the accelerator to cause her more harm. Tossed backward as he sped away, Cassie twisted around and, using her foot, pushed until she could lean her back against the wall just under the window, attempting to take some pressure off of her hands and shoulders. A quick glance around let her know she and Sergeant Leonard were the only two people on the bus. Living in hiding over the past few months, her mother had drilled into Cassie and her sister Haley to trust no one. They had been instructed to keep all personal information about themselves private, and if they ever found themselves in danger, to stay quiet and pay attention to the details of their environment, so if possible, they could escape or provide clues for her to find them. 
She and Haley had also spent a few weeks after arriving in Hardwick taking self-defense classes. Although Cassie had been practicing, she knew she was nowhere near capable of defending herself against Sergeant Leonard. Terrified and alone, Cassie allowed silent tears to roll down her cheeks. After nearly an hour of riding along the dirt road with Sergeant Leonard and watching one car speed by them, Cassie drifted into a deep sleep. She did not feel the bus stop and groggily awoke when Sergeant Leonard roughly pulled her to her feet. Wincing, Cassie let out a quiet whimper as the painful pins and needles sensations coursed through her arms, which had gone numb. Hearing her whimper, Sergeant Leonard leaned down and looked into her eyes with a sadistic smile. Oh, did I hurt you? he said, mocking her. Exhausted and tired of his mistreatment, Cassie ignored her instincts to stay quiet and asked, Why are you being so mean? Sergeant Leonard's sadistic smile broadened and he stood to his full height. Mean? he asked, feigning, feeling wounded. You think picking you up out of your seat is mean? Let me show you what I think is mean. Cassie's face paled as she saw him bring his hands up to her neck. He caressed her throat, bringing his thumbs up under her chin and pushing it, forcing her to look him in the eyes. As their eyes met, Sergeant Leonard let out a soft moan and smirked as he slowly began to squeeze his hands around her throat. Cassie's hands were still in handcuffs behind her and she could do nothing to stop him, but close her eyes to avoid seeing his sadistic smile. Her body started to spasm as it struggled to breathe, but still she squeezed her eyes shut, denying him the satisfaction of seeing her fear. Sergeant Leonard, a man sharply yelled. Cassie opened her eyes as Sergeant Leonard removed his hands, turned and saluted him. Sir, your talents are needed elsewhere. Leave the girl with me. Yes, sir, Sergeant Leonard responded. Before he left, he looked over to Cassie and said, another time then, and walked away. The man was not as tall as Sergeant Leonard, but appeared to be of a higher rank because of his confident stance and Sergeant Leonard's reaction. The name on his badge read Lieutenant Sands. Turn around. I'm going to remove the handcuffs. Struggling to catch her breath, she followed Lieutenant Sands' instructions, and after a few moments, Cassie's arms were free. Heavy and sore, she began to rub her aching arms and wrists. Turning around to face Lieutenant Sands, Cassie wondered nervously what he had in store for her. Fearful of speaking first, Cassie stayed silent as Lieutenant Sands assessed her. So, tell me your name, Lieutenant Sands said in a tone conveying she now had permission to speak. Cat, <clears throat> Cassie quickly cleared her throat, remembering not to give personal information and finished with, Lysandra, sir. Calisandra, he repeated. Yes, sir, Calisandra Carver. And your age? Sixteen, sir. In which location were you assigned? Cassie was not sure how to answer without putting herself in danger, so she shook her head slightly. Don't want to tell me, Lieutenant Sands asked. Cassie shook her head again. I see, Lieutenant Sands said while slightly furrowing his brows. You do know we have ways of finding out, he said, giving her a second chance. Cassie remained silent. As you may have experienced, Sergeant Leonard is very skilled at motivating people into sharing their deepest secrets. Shall we schedule some time for the two of you to work together? Cassie shuddered. No, no, no. I was um, assigned up near the Rocky Hills at, at Hardwick, hoping Hardwick was a real place. Lieutenant Sand's eyes squinted suspiciously. Hardwick? Hmm. Cassie nodded earnestly. Come with me. Lieutenant Sands guided Cassie in front of him, and together they exited the bus. Stepping off of the bus, Cassie noticed she had been brought to a type of military compound. They walked past a row of buses along a series of wired fences enclosing sectioned housing and on toward a collection of tan-colored buildings. Cassie noticed any time they passed men dressed similar to Sergeant Leonard, they all stopped and saluted him until he had completely passed. Lieutenant Sands continued walking undisturbed as though he did not see them, but Cassie suspected otherwise. They reached a single-story tan building numbered 125 Administration, where two armed men staring directly forward opened the doors for them. A man at the front desk stood and saluted when Lieutenant Sands entered the Administration building. As you were, Lieutenant Sands told the man who proceeded to sit back down at the desk and wait for further instructions. Pulling Cassie forward, Lieutenant Sands dictated, Calisandra Carver, 16, runaway, from Hardwick. Cassie watched the man writing the details and noticed him pause at the word Hardwick, 
quickly glancing up at Lieutenant Sands to see if he heard correctly. Lieutenant Sands gave a slow and nearly imperceptible nod. <sighs> Cassie's stomach dropped, and she swallowed hard while doing her best not to display any of the fear she was feeling. Have her taken to the camp, Lieutenant Sands instructed. He then turned to face Cassie, looking as if he wanted to tell her something important. However, before he could proceed, a loud buzzer rang at the desk. Sir, Sergeant Leonard is requesting for you to visit cell 17. He has obtained the information you requested. Thank you. And with that, Lieutenant Sands turned and exited the building without a second glance. Cassie looked at the man behind the desk. He nodded for her to sit in one of the chairs against the wall. After less than a minute, another armed guard entered the building and indicated she should come with him. They walked to a smaller building with partition dressing areas closed off by flimsy curtains. The armed guard went to a cabinet, pulled out an army green colored jumpsuit and a pair of boots and handed them to Cassie. While she nervously changed her clothes, the guard searched through her backpack, returning it to her as she came out of the dressing booth. Cassie quickly crammed her clothing into her bag while he walked her to one of the fenced-in housing units. The guard unlocked the gated door, signaled for Cassie to enter, locked the door behind her, and left without saying a word. Cassie looked around the empty courtyard and hesitantly walked toward the housing unit. Taking a deep breath before opening the door to the entrance, Cassie mentally embraced her father's words. If you let fear win, you lose. <sighs> Dad, wherever you are, I sure hope you are right. Opening the door, she was surprised by the sound of many people talking at once. Her eyes adjusted to the room. She saw a series of tables occupied by others who were also wearing army green jumpsuits. Standing at the doorway without moving, she heard the loudness of the conversations begin to quiet into murmurs. Suddenly, a young man walked over to Cassie, smiling cheerfully. Hey, 16, name's Jordan, he said. And you are? Calisandra, Cassie responded quietly, internally telling herself, trust no one. Well, Calisandra, welcome to the camp. And that was Stephanie Douglas reading a sample chapter from her latest book, Calisandra Fractured. Hey, that book is available right now. It is on Kindle Unlimited. Both of her books are available on Kindle Unlimited. So click the link in the show notes for the books and to find and follow Stephanie Douglas. You won't regret it. Hey, don't forget to also click the links for our friends and sponsors alike, the uh, Project Entertainment Network and Pop Goes the Culture Network. And especially, I invite you to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when we come back with an all-new author, a new book, and a brand new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. Thinking about you. We'll see you again real, real soon. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.